People say that there are so many Irish people there. It's like home. Is that right? Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, I know it's been a minute since my last video. Life got very busy there for a while, uh, but I'm really excited to be back here today talking about Brooklyn, the novel and the film. Uh, this is a video I've wanted to make for ages, so I'm really excited. For those of you who are coming back after seeing my uh, other videos, welcome. Uh, and for those of you who are new to my channel, welcome as well. Um, my name is Outstanding in my field. I make video essays on Irish books, TV shows and films, as well as Irish representation in general in media. And if you're interested in supporting me in making more of this content, please do give this video a like and subscribe to my channel so you can be updated about my future videos. So, Brooklyn is a 2009 novel by Irish author Cullum Tobin, uh, which was adapted to film in 2015 in a co-production between Canada, the United Kingdom and Ireland. Uh, the film, starring Saoirse Ronan, was directed by John Crowley, uh, with a screenplay written by Nick Hornby. As novel to film adaptations go, this is a pretty faithful one. Uh, although, as we're, we'll be discussing later, there are some significant uh, but subtle changes, and particularly with regards to the ending. But first, let's discuss what the two share by looking at the general plot of both. Spoilers ahead if you haven't seen the film or read the book. Brooklyn is set in the 1950s and follows a young Irish woman called Eilish Lacey, uh, who emigrates to Brooklyn, New York, due to a lack of opportunities for her at home. Eilish wants to become an accountant, and through the support system already in place for Irish immigrants in Brooklyn, uh, in the form of the priest, uh, Father Flood, and the landlady, Mrs. Kyo, Eilish gets a job at a department store and begins to adapt to life in America. But she finds herself struggling with homesickness and isolation. At a dance organised by Father Flood, Eilish meets Italian-American plumber Tony Fiorello, who is instantly smitten with her. As Eilish and Tony's relationship begins to take off rather more quickly than Eilish was expecting, back home her sister Rose dies and Eilish is pressured to return to Ireland as their mother is now alone. Uh, before she goes, Tony and Eilish have sex and Tony persuades her to marry him in secret. When Eilish returns to Ireland, uh, there's a new glamour about her due to her time in Brooklyn, uh, and many of the townspeople who used to ignore her are suddenly intrigued, including Jim Farrell, uh, son of the, one of the big businessmen in town. Jim, of course, is unaware of Eilish's marriage to Tony. While Eilish and Jim start to spend more time together, Eilish starts to do some bookkeeping work as the new qualifications that she earned in America have given her an edge that she didn't have before. Eilish keeps putting off her return to America and extends her stay at home. It's only when one of the townspeople, Miss Kelly, informs Eilish that she knows about her secret marriage um, that Eilish is finally pushed into returning to America and to Tony. She leaves a note for Jim and leaves home for a second time. So, as we can see, uh, in terms of the substance of the plot, at least, the film follows the novel quite closely. The big change, the one that stands out the most, is the ending. Nick Hornby, who wrote the screenplay, um, downplayed this change when he was asked about it in an interview, claiming that he only really extended the ending uh, of the novel by a few minutes in the film uh, to show us Eilish's journey back to America and her reunion with Tony, uh, rather than cutting things off just as she's leaving Ireland, which is what happens in the novel. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, we know. We knew where she was going, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, we all felt that people would want to see her there, and that when she got there, it would put a lot of things into context for her. In his view, the ending of the film is a logical continuation of what the novel suggests. But in fact, it's an ending that logically follows from only one specific reading of the novel. And this added on ending, we see Eilish giving advice to an Irish girl who is about to emigrate to Brooklyn herself. And then we see Eilish waiting for Tony at his place of work, the couple embracing, while Eilish in voiceover confirms to the audience that she is home. So in this reading of Tobin's novel, Eilish's true love is Tony, her true home is Brooklyn, and in leaving Ireland she has in fact had a lucky escape from a gossipy, backstabbing small town environment and from an ill-advised flirtation. There's nothing exactly wrong with this reading of Brooklyn, uh, it's certainly there. The ending of the novel is deliberately ambiguous 
and Colm Tobin himself has stated that he enjoys the film ending. This, by contrast, is the last paragraph of the novel when Eilish is wondering what Jim's reaction to her leaving will be. She has gone back to Brooklyn, her mother would say. And as the train rolled past MacMine Bridge on its way towards Wexford, Eilish imagined the years ahead, when these words would come to mean less and less to the man who heard them, and would come to mean more and more to herself. She almost smiled at the thought of it, then closed her eyes and tried to imagine nothing more. How Eilish is feeling here is certainly up to interpretation. Um, heartbroken, relieved, amused, afraid, all of the above, uh, or something else entirely. We don't know. Tobin's limited third-person perspective in the novel gives us only some insight into Eilish's thought process, and this is consistent with the way he uses um, this perspective in the rest of the novel. But one thing that we can say for sure, and this is also true in the case of the film, is that Eilish doesn't have a choice when she leaves Ireland for a second time. And while in the novel this is very clear, the film consciously deflects the audience's attention from this lack of choice through a variety of techniques, uh, through the actors' performances and the way that these performances are directed, uh, and crucially, through the screenplay. The novel's events are often framed in a different way in the film. New scenes might be added in the case of the ending, or various scenes from the novel are removed. Now, why does the film do this? And why is Eilish's lack of choice important? This is what we're going to discuss now. And we're going to start by looking at Eilish herself as a passive heroine. So the first thing that we can say about Eilish in general, which is true in both the novel and the film, is that she doesn't really make her own choices about anything. She doesn't choose to emigrate to America. Her mother and her sister Rose arrange everything and she goes along with the plans. And in the historical context of the story, the situation in Ireland is certainly dire in terms of jobs. Ireland during the 1950s was near bankrupt and was suffering through austerity and instability. As noted in this article in the Irish Times, uh, when the first programme of economic expansion was introduced, it was noted that the common talk amongst parents in the towns, as in rural Ireland, is of their children having to emigrate as soon as their education is complete in order to be sure of a reasonable livelihood. And this was in 1958. Brooklyn, or the film at least, is set around 1952, so more immediately post-war. Eilish does have a part-time job in Miss Kelly's shop before she leaves Ireland, though she doesn't have many hours. And it's also clear that if she put up any active opposition to leaving, to emigrating, that her family would not force her to go. But anyway, she goes, and uh, once she gets to New York, it's Father Flood who gets her job in his friend's department store, and he also enrolls her in bookkeeping classes. So everyone around Eilish has arranged everything, and as we see her acknowledge herself later, when she's suffering through a, a severe bout of homesickness, she really has had no, no say in any of this. Maybe, she thought, they had never known her, any of them, because if they had, then they would have had to realise what this would be like for her. Eilish, as well as not making her own decisions, uh, is a character whom everyone else seems to want to project onto. In this sense, she's a bit of a blank slate. For instance, the landlady, Mrs Kyo, decides pretty early on that Eilish is different from the other boarders uh, because she's mannerly. And it's for this reason that Mrs Kyo moves her to a room in the house that has its own entrance trusting that Eilish won't use it to sneak anyone in. Eilish is annoyed by this because she feels she hasn't really done anything to deserve this good opinion, and also because Mrs Kyo's favouritism will cause problems for her uh, with the other boarders in the house. It's understandable that the film leaves out this particular nuance, uh, since it would be hard to translate to screen. But as we'll see later on, the film also softens Mrs Kyo's character in other crucial ways. But to go back to Eilish, we also see her mother do the same thing later on uh, when Eilish returns to Ireland. Rather than asking her any questions about America, Eilish's mother seems to expect her to fall into the role that her sister Rose has left vacant. Eilish, for her part, also finds herself imitating her sister Rose whenever she wants to appear confident or assertive. In the morning, it was hard not to think that she was Rose's ghost, 
being fed and spoken to in the same way at the same time by her mother, having her clothes admired using the same words as were used with Rose, and then setting out briskly for work. As she took the same route, Eilish had to stop herself walking with Rose's elegant, determined walk, and move more slowly. Cullum Tobin explained in an interview with The Guardian that in writing Eilish, he was inspired by Jane Austen's heroine Fanny Price in Mansfield Park, a character so passive that nearly all the adaptations of that novel have tried to update or modernise her in some way, uh, unsuccessfully, at least in my opinion. For Tobin, Eilish being passive is crucial in driving the final crisis of the novel. As he puts it, everyone wants her and likes her, and she does nothing to cause this, which causes havoc in the end because she doesn't, in fact, know how she feels. It's difficult to translate a passive character to screen, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. And as we saw earlier, the film Brooklyn does stick to the novel in terms of the general movements of the plot. But because it doesn't find other ways of showing us that Eilish is passive, uh, the consequences of her being passive, this havoc that Tobin talks about, are presented in another way. We see this first in the way that her relationship with Tony plays out. In the film, the whole courtship between Eilish and Tony is softer, more romantic, uh, this is partly due to the performances themselves. There's this kind of admiration for an era in which men were seen as more direct in their pursuit of women and more serious from the start. Yeah, I would. And it's also because because now it's... It, it, it it's is, a game now. Well, now it's just as forward but in this backhanded kind of way where you're tweeting on somebody's picture and being like, you look hot, instead of just, you know, talking to a person. Since Cohen plays Tony in this very gentle way, some of, uh, some of Tony's more pushy behaviour to Eilish appears in a more favourable light to the audience. But of course, Saoirse Ronan's performance as Eilish is also crucial here, uh, because even Cohen's best efforts wouldn't be able to save the character of Tony if Eilish's reactions to him weren't also favourable. In this scene where Eilish tells Tony that maybe she loves him too, her part plays out almost word for word the same as in the novel, but Ronan's interpretation is key here. Through her performance, you get the sense that Eilish is only holding back because she's shy, rather than because she's fearful or even panicked. I have thought about you. And I like you. And I like being with you. But at this same point in the novel, Eilish is panicking because she knows that she has to make a decision. While she's afraid of being trapped by Tony, she's also afraid of losing him, presumably because of the period of intense loneliness and homesickness that she's just been through. Maybe she thought she should say to him that she did not want to talk about their kids when they had known each other only a short time. But then he might ask her, she believed, if she was not serious about him, and she would be forced to answer, to say something. And if it was not fully encouraging, she might, she knew, lose him. He was not someone who would enjoy having a girlfriend who was not sure how much she liked him. She knew him well enough to know that. So Eilish, even though she's unsure, makes a kind of a compromise. She gives a half confession of love. She says just enough to keep Tony on the line, while also not making any solid commitment. In the film, though, this is played off as a kind of shyness on her part, or even, I would say, as a kind of flirtatious move, playing hard to get. So we have Cohen and Ronan's performances uh, both helping to reassure the audience that there's nothing uncomfortable in Tony's behaviour to Eilish and that Eilish's reluctance in telling him uh, that she likes him is, is perfectly natural. But of course, the musical score by Michael Brook also helps to dictate to the audience how they should be feeling in these scenes, uh, playing a similar role that a uh, narration in a novel might play. And then there's also John Crowley's direction of the actors, his placement of them in the shot to give this sense of intimacy and romance. And of course, there's Nick Hornby's screenplay. As I said, uh, Hornby changes very little about Eilish's speech to Tony. His changes are more subtle, shifting around events and conversations so that by the time we get to this confession of love, if you want to call it that, um, the context is quite different. For instance, uh, the real moment in their courtship where Tony pushes Eilish too far is when he casually mentions that he hopes their children will be Dodgers fans. 
Uh, in the novel, this line occurs during a one-on-one -on -one conversation and Tony doesn't notice that he's made Eilish uncomfortable. But in the film, the line is instead put into the scene where Eilish meets Tony's family and he says it almost by accident. It's more innocent in this context because it slips out when he's relaxed and with other people. You could say that none of this matters uh, if we interpret Eilish as being in, in love with Tony. In my reading uh, of the novel and in film, she certainly isn't. But for argument's sake, let's say that she is. I think the film would still be doing a disservice to her character in the novel uh, by not showing us just how much Eilish struggles with making her own decisions or by not showing just how much she agonizes over the conversation with Tony that in the film has just played off as a, as a cute little love scene. But because she's acting exactly how she's expected to act, because she's quiet, mannerly to Mrs. Kyo, uh, aloof with Tony. Everyone around her prefers to have their own ideas about her and nobody really sees Eilish's struggle. The expectations of women in the 1950s were different. The expectations of Catholic Irish women even more so. Middle-class women were expected to give up their careers once they married. The social consequences of sleeping with someone outside of marriage uh, would be much more severe than they are today. We could say then that at least part of Eilish's struggle over making decisions has to do with the immense societal pressure that she's under. And that in losing this nuance, the film is losing some of that historical context, which is so key to the story. One of the strongest arguments, I think, in favour of my reading, uh, that Eilish doesn't love Tony, is the fact that she never mentions him in her letters home to her mother. And this is over a period of several months. She has ample opportunity then once she goes home to mention him to her mother, but she still doesn't. It's clear that as well as being unsure about her feelings for him, Eilish is also a little ashamed of Tony. And we see this come through much more strongly in the novel. Even in her letters home to her sister Rose, which do mention Tony, Eilish is reluctant to give the detail of his profession, that he is a plumber. While Eilish and her family uh, in their native town of Enniscorthy were looked down on by a lot of the other res residents, including Miss Kelly, uh, Eilish obviously still considers herself a step above Tony in terms of class. And we see another example of this in the way Eilish reacts to the new girl in her boarding house, Dolores, who cleans houses for a living. But in the film, Eilish's dislike of Dolores is just played for laughs and uh, the class element is absent. It's just because Dolores is from Cavan and is a bit annoying. Haha. <laughs> The film seems very afraid of making Eilish unlikable, so a lot of these moments from the novel are therefore lost. And this, I would say, is also part of the reason why Saoirse Ronan plays Eilish's love confession in the way that she does. To have Eilish shy or unsure about her feelings, rather than panicking over the fact that she might lose Tony uh, if she doesn't tell him that she is serious about him, uh, makes her seem less selfish to the audience. In short, the more passive Eilish is, the less palatable she is to the audience. This is one of the things that makes the novel so interesting. Eilish, by dragging her feet, by not asserting herself and making her own decisions, often ends up hurting the other characters around her. Towards the end of the novel, we get this line in Eilish's narration. And she saw all three of them, Tony, Jim, her mother, as figures whom she could only damage as innocent people surrounded by light and clarity, and circling around them was herself, dark, uncertain. But Eilish is not the only selfish character in Brooklyn. Let's come back to Tony. Yes, in both the novel and the film, he's a genuinely empathetic person. He's there for Eilish when her sister Rose dies. But he also seizes this moment of grieving, this moment of emotional vulnerability to push Eilish into doing what up till now she has been reluctant to do in making a solid commitment to him. He persuades her to marry him in secret before she returns to Ireland. Why do you want me to do it? It will just be something between us. But why do you want it? When he spoke now, he had tears in his eyes. Because if we don't do it, I'm going to go crazy. Not only is this emotionally manipulative on Tony's part, but we can see too that here he's also acknowledging Eilish's passivity, but also that he sees the solution to her passivity as uh, depriving her of a choice. By marrying Tony now, 
Eilish will have to return to America. At least this is how he frames the secret marriage as something that will help her not have to make a decision. But really it's for his own sake, uh, so that he doesn't have to live with the uncertainty and suspense of wondering whether she will come back or not. Besides Tony's emotional manipulation, other factors that play into Eilish agreeing to marry him are the fact that they've already had sex. In the novel, we get a scene of her going to confession after the fact. Uh, we also see the consequences of her sleeping with Tony in that Mrs. Kyo, aware that Eilish sneaked Tony into her room one night, starts treating Eilish coldly. And even the priest, Father Flood, changes in his demeanour to her. All of this is very accurate to the way that 1950s Catholic Ireland would have treated young women who had sex outside of marriage. And these sexual standards have been uh, transferred fully intact from Ireland into the expat community of Irish people in Brooklyn. The man who got Eilish her job and her bookkeeping classes is a priest, and this is not by accident. Priests at the time were not just moral arbiters, uh, they played an active role in the community. So Tobin, by including the character of Father Flood and giving him such a key role in the story, is showing this. So given all of this, Eilish is under pressure to marry Tony now that they've had sex. But you've probably guessed it, none of this is included in the film. Uh, pretty much as soon as Tony and Eilish have had sex in the film, uh, Tony suggests that they get married. And uh, this morality therefore evidently still exists, but we don't have to deal with its uncomfortable consequences here. Instead, we see the nice side of it. Tony appears less selfish in this context for wanting to marry Eilish, because it just seems like an extension of his chivalry, of his gentlemanly, gallant courtship of her up to this point. While up until this point in the novel, we can talk about Eilish not making her own choices, uh, as soon as she's married Tony, the issue becomes more that she doesn't have a choice to begin with. And this lack of choice is what leads to the central conflict of the novel. When Eilish returns to Ireland, she finds herself falling in love with Jim Farrell. Their relationship is doomed from the beginning and it's only possible in the first place because the only person back home whom Eilish told about her relationship with Tony, her sister Rose, is dead. So the relationship between Eilish and Jim is based on deception and the film really leans into this. If Tony and Brooklyn represent Eilish's true home and true future, then Jim Farrell is a lie and Eilish's native town of Enniscorthy a mere illusion of home. A place where she no longer belongs and where she has to pretend to be someone else in order to fit in. When this lie is revealed, therefore, by the spiteful Miss Kelly, this leads to a triumphant moment for Eilish. She stands up to the woman who used to look down on her. She asserts her identity as Tony's wife and in so doing shows that she's not ashamed of him, even if he doesn't have the kind of job that someone like Miss Kelly would consider respectable. Eilish is now a Brooklyn girl, after all, and in Brooklyn anyone can be anything. In Brooklyn class distinctions don't matter as much. In Brooklyn, people don't gossip and backstab and scheme, or at least this is what the film is telling us. Made explicit in the line that Eilish utters to Miss Kelly, a line which was written for the screenplay, I'd forgotten what this town was like. Nick Hornby, when asked whether he thought Eilish had a choice or not, points to this moment as one where she does have agency. And, yeah. um, the one choice she had, I think, she took, which is that towards the end of the film, she stands up to somebody who is trying to bully yeah. her. Uh, but this scene in both novel and film has the same consequence. Eilish is forced to do what she's been putting off and return to America. It's just that the film cleverly frames this confrontation between Eilish and Miss Kelly through a few small changes to make Eilish's return to America seem triumphant. In this framing, the spatial difference between Ireland and Brooklyn becomes temporal. Ireland is behind and Brooklyn is ahead. Ireland represents Eilish's past and Brooklyn represents Eilish's future. Eilish's final monologue delivered to another passenger on the ship is really addressed to her past self. It's there to show us, the audience, how far she's come. And then you'll catch yourself thinking about something or someone who has no connection with the past, someone who's only yours. 
So the fact that Eilish doesn't really have a choice in this context doesn't seem to matter as much. She's embracing her return to Brooklyn, nevertheless. It's almost as if Tony wrote the ending. He's the one, after all, who suggested that it would be better if Eilish made a commitment to him straight away, because then she wouldn't be persuaded or guilted into staying in Ireland. The film seems to be telling us the same thing, so that when we walk away afterwards we can say to each other, well, it was a good thing really that Tony made Eilish marry him when he did. If he hadn't, then she might have married Donald Gleeson, and we all know how that would have turned out. Of course, the question of uh, how it would have turned out if Eilish had married Jim is really irrelevant. The fact of the matter is that she should have had a choice. It isn't just Tony who's to blame here, but also Irish society's attitudes at the time to extramarital sex and to divorce. Because Tony has married her and because divorce is absolutely unacceptable in Catholic Ireland in the 1950s, Eilish is in an impossible situation. Even if Jim accepted her after learning the truth, he would have to stand in opposition to the entire community. By returning to Brooklyn, Eilish is saving him from having to make that choice. So then factor in Eilish's mother, her loneliness after losing one of her daughters to emigration and the other to death, and her, her disappointment when she learns that there was never really any hope of Eilish staying in Ireland or marrying Jim Farrell. And what you have is an incredibly complex psychological and ethical conflict it's about what happens when someone is physically and emotionally divided between two places. What happens when a lie gets so large that it encompasses everything and how the untangling of that lie will involve hurting somebody. It's not just a question of Eilish being divided between two men, but this is really what the film boils it down to, a love triangle. And why is that? Well, the film Brooklyn came out in 2015 and love triangles sold back then. Uh, the immensely popular Twilight franchise, which also revolved around a passive heroine being divided between two men, uh, had proven this a few years before, that love triangles were incredibly profitable. The Twilight saga grossed a massive $3.3 billion worldwide, and its last installment, Breaking Dawn Part 2, had come out just three years before Brooklyn in 2012. Whatever your opinions on Twilight, it can't be denied uh, that it was successful and it had a huge impact on pop culture. The Twilight fandom formed two main camps uh, in regards to this love triangle, Team Jacob and Team Edward. Then there's the Hunger Games franchise, which came out around the same time too, uh, whose central plot revolves around a revolution, but which in media and in online discourse was often boiled down to the love triangle between Katniss, Pita and Gale. So with Brooklyn, instead of asking whether Eilish had a choice or not, instead of digging into this incredibly complex conflict, uh, we instead ask who she should have chosen. We identify ourselves as Team Tony or Team Jim. Uh, as a side note, this is the poster released for Brooklyn in Hong Kong, so it's clear that some people at least were Team Jim. I'm half joking here, of course, uh, and the greater focus on the love triangle in Brooklyn might have just been a marketing decision. But we can see it reflected in the film itself, uh, in the way that Tony's courtship of Eilish is more romantic and less pragmatic, in the way in which scenes involving Eilish and Tony are visually juxtaposed with scenes involving Eilish and Jim. Yet, as with many other Hollywood films involving love triangles, there is only ever one real option, not just because Eilish has no choice but to go back to Tony, but because in doing so, she is depicted as choosing truth over deception, reality over illusion, the future over the past. The love triangle is not as popular now as it was in the 2010s, and this is partly because we've seen an ebbing in the popularity of young adult franchises that made heavy use of this trope. The romance films of the last few years have tended more towards the literary adaptation or remake side of things, um, and even at the time of Brooklyn's release, this was a trope that was dying down. And what's interesting is that in the behind the scenes interviews, uh, a number of the actors and the director drew direct comparisons between a film like Brooklyn and big blockbuster movies like Star Wars. Brooklyn is not a blockbuster or a franchise film. You don't want it ever to feel like a movie movie, you know, and it, it's you're trying to create a world which people feel they know very well. And of course, they know that it very well through the movies. 
This would suggest that Brooklyn should be less restricted by genre convention in comparison to these blockbuster films. Yet, it is convention that boils down the complexity of the novel into a love triangle. It is convention, namely the strong female character trope, uh, one that was also very popular during the 2010s, that demands that Eilish have some kind of moment of assertion or agency, as we see in her confrontation with Miss Kelly in the film. Even the screenwriter, uh, Nick Hornby, admits the difficulty in this requirement for strong female characters in cinema when it comes to making period pieces uh, about an era in which women had fewer choices than they have now. The trope of the strong female character has been thoroughly dissected by now and thankfully is not as popular in film anymore. So I won't dwell on it any further than to say that superficial strength, physical prowess, courage, aggressiveness or assertiveness should not be requirements for female characters in cinema or otherwise. And that the trope itself has become almost as harmful as the tropes, the older tropes that it was designed to combat. Why I keep emphasising the greater complexity of Cullum Tobin's novel, therefore, is because this complexity contributes to a greater authenticity in depicting Eilish's experience as an immigrant, her struggle to maintain her identity, and her struggle to decide what she wants and to assert herself. This is linked to the more complicated class uh, dissection that we discussed earlier, and also how Eilish's experiences in Brooklyn bring up as well questions of race and LGBTQ plus identity, questions that are left out of the film. Complexity does not always mean superiority. Simple stories work. There is a reason why we have conventions in the first place and why we have archetypes and certain kinds of stories that recur. Because these conventions differ when it comes to the medium of the novel and the medium of film, some changes to Brooklyn were obviously necessary. Maybe the film didn't have time to explore Miss Fortini's obvious interest in Eilish or the racist attitudes of many of the employees at the department store where Eilish works uh, towards black customers. But I don't think the different requirements of film as a medium explain why the overall ambiguity of Tobin's novel had to be lost. Hornby cites this as the main reason why the ending had to be changed, arguing that film can't be too ambiguous. But I would say in response to that firstly that maybe the big blockbuster and franchise films that dominate Hollywood today uh, might be too trapped by convention to allow for much ambiguity in their storytelling, but Brooklyn, the film, is neither. Secondly, film as a medium is capable of ambiguity. For one thing, it doesn't have narration like a novel, so we're not always aware of what the characters are thinking. But the actors' performances can also leave room for ambiguity. Take the ending scene of the film Brooklyn, for example. The girl on the boat tells Eilish that she's heard that Brooklyn is just like home and asks her if that's true. Yes. It's just like home. You could interpret this line in, in several different ways. You could see this as the moment where Eilish realises that Brooklyn is her home, as she later asserts. Or given the expression on Eilish's face, how she's so obviously moved by the girl's innocence and uncertainty, you could interpret what she says as a comforting lie. She could be saying what she knows the girl wants to hear at that moment, that Brooklyn is just like Ireland. Or this line could be pointing to the fact that since the class differences, racism and restrictive morality of 1950s Ireland are replicated in the Irish expat community in Brooklyn, that Brooklyn is just like home, complete with all its restrictions, prejudices and societal expectations. In this reading, uh, Brooklyn doesn't represent a more progressive future at all. But because of what follows in the film, because we see Eilish's reunion with Tony on a sunlit street, because we hear the swelling music and the certainty in Eilish's voice as she delivers her closing narration, we know exactly what we're supposed to take away from the film. Where my problem lies with the film is in its disingenuous approach to the main conflict of the story. Rather than admitting the true horror of Eilish's position, that she has no choice but to return to Tony and to Brooklyn, it pretends that there is a right choice and a wrong choice. It undermines the ethical complexity of the novel for the sake of providing its audience with a comforting lie. That in life, as long as you are moving, you are moving forward. 
that if you emigrate to a new country, you will become a new person. In the service of this lie, the film also softens what was a particularly harsh period for Irish women in history. This is why, like Eilish leaving Ireland, I come away from the film with mixed feelings. And then each time he came to the chorus, he looked at her, letting the melody become sweeter by slowing down the pace, putting his head down then, managing to suggest even more that he had not merely learned the song, but that he meant it. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And don't forget to like and subscribe. And tell me in the comments, are you team Tony or are you team Jim? That's the real question. Until next time, guys, I'm really looking forward to seeing you again. Take care. Bye.